Well, Shabbat Shalom, everyone. Shabbat Shalom, and thank you so much for joining us today on Yah's holy, holy day of the week. We thank you for joining us virtually as well. Today we're going to talk about out with the old and in with the new. And this is important. This is a lesson based upon teaching the relevance of the New Testament. Testament, I'm sorry, the New Testament, where it comes from, and I think that's very important. Mm -hmm. This lesson is sponsored by the House of Shiloh Ministries and presented by Brother Andrew Bradley. That is me. All right, so we're going to talk about today out with the old, in with the new. Is that really what we're going to be talking about? No. What we're going to talk about is that the new is the old and the old is the new. And understanding the source of the New Testament scriptures. Mm -hmm. Really, that's really what we're going to talk about today. Mm -hmm. All right? Get my mouth's working here. We're going to go to the table of contents. And this is going to grow. But we're going to start off with our introduction. And then we're going to define the meaning of what is New Testament. What does, what does it really mean? And then we're going to look at the, its history. And when was the, the, the book created? When, the, when were the individual books and letters written? And when they were created? That's important because it gives you an idea of what was taught during the, the life of our Messiah, the disciples, Paul, and so on. Then we'll just go over the Old Testament, what's in the Old Testament. And this is important because we want to understand how long it's been around and why it's relevant because what else they got they're gonna teach from something, right? And that something is gonna be very old and have historical relevance. And then we're gonna talk about the apocryphal, why it was removed. And that's a very significant portion because it was spoken of in scripture as well. Okay? Mm -hmm. And then we'll talk more about the old testament source of the New Testament, where we really will expound on that part. All right. And this probably will, this table of contents will probably grow as we continue. This, this, this lesson has a lot of scriptures in it. All right. We'll go ahead and move to the introduction and I'll just read through this. So what is the New Testament? And believe it or not, in the church, it's very few people ask this because one, the New Testament is very young compared to the Old Testament. Mm -hmm. And many feel that it's, it's what is relevant today, the New Testament. And this is this will be argued, of course, this will be argued if you if you bring this up in certain religious circles. And there's always two sides to that argument. Is the New Testament really new? Is the Old Testament just that? The old. Right? When we look at scripture though, we do keep in mind the, um, the timeline of events, the authors of the text, the intended audience. Those are things that we need to do. But the church does not do that at all. To them, scripture is scripture. They don't give or care about time, audience, author, anything like that. So most likely, we, no, we haven't been taught to do this. And I hope after we complete this lesson, you'll see that there is nothing new under the sun at all. Mm -hmm. So, to help us start with our understanding, we're going to define New Testament. And I think that the word New Testament needs to be defined in reference to the Scripture. So, mm -hmm. let's move to our next section. Defining the meaning of New Testament. Okay? Mm -hmm. Alright, to help understand the history of the New Testament, it is necessary to understand what it really means. And let's begin with scripture. And brother, brother, can you please read? Third, Matthew 26, verse 20, verses 27 to 28. And he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them, saying, Drink ye all of it, for this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many, it's which is shed for many for the remissions of, the, of sins. Now, people will argue, well, the New Testament's not about Torah. Well, Yahushua's right here keeping Torah right now. Mm -hmm. He was observing the Passover meal with his disciples just before he was going to be put to death. All right, well after 
Romans, I mean, Matthew 5, 17, where he said, I did not come to destroy the law, but fulfill. So this verse already brings into life Torah. And that means it's already related to the old. But, but for now, we'll stick with the definition of New Testament just so we can understand it, all right? And then we're going to bring in how this this relevance, this relationship is absolutely true, okay? Mm-hmm. Well, let's move to the next slide and talk about the word new. And that's a kainos in Greek. And new, which is which as recently made is superior to what is succeeds. And the question that should come to mind is, what is this New Testament, and what did it succeed? And what does succeed mean? To come next after another. And that's Merriam-Webster. Mm-hmm. So the definition of new does not mean to destroy the previous or to make an end to the previous. That's important. It just said it was better or it followed or succeeded the previous, but it never it never got rid of the old. It doesn't say that. This word does not mean that. All right? Mm-hmm. We're, we're okay with this one so far? Anybody got questions? No, I think you're just saying it, or, it doesn't replace it. It does not replace it. Mm-hmm. In fact, in fact, you'll see that it builds on it because at the heart of the original covenant is Torah obedience because that's what the covenant is it's built on Torah it's Torah obedience the new one requires that so it builds on it it builds on it and we'll talk about that in a few minutes all right let's look at the word testament die a the K. I, I think I got that right. D D D after K. D after K. And the Strong's definition is a disposition, that is a contract, a covenant. And in the Thayer's definition, it's a testament or will, a compact or covenant. Hmm. And we could get in really we can really get particular about this because if it's a will, mm-hmm. for example, just to point out how this testament this testament does refer to the old. A testament or will only is inheritable. Okay? And and, and a will only applies to the family. Rarely does it apply to someone outside. And when it does, guess what happens? You got a court fight on your hands because that's something that rarely happens. So when you see testament or a will, you're looking at something that is inherited or related to a line of people, a family. So this is pointing to something that's pre-existing. Okay? Does that make sense? Yes. All right. We're going to continue. We're going to restate it now. All right. Now, I'm using superior here, and I'll I'll show you about that. I mean, superior here, but we're we're going to also rename it something else. So really what we should be saying here is, and he took the cup and gave thanks, and gave it to them, saying, Drink ye all of it, for this is my body of the superior cup, which is shared for many for the remissions of sins. Now, Paul speaks of this superior covenant, or better covenant. And he says, Hebrews 8 and 6, but now has, has I say Paul, I keep, I'm going to keep saying Paul wrote Hebrews, even though they don't really know who wrote it. But it's, it, the language is so much like Paul's writing. But now has he obtained a more excellent ministry, by how much also he is the mediator of a better covenant, which was established upon better promises. Thus we know that what Yahushua stated during the last Passover meal was a better covenant, not the replacement of the original Mm -hmm. at all. And we're going to examine why in a little bit, this is, in, this is important to understand. This is important to understand. And, I'm, and I thank Yah for it being better. <laughs> it just, because the old covenant said, the, the original covenant says, you will have life, you'll be prosperous, prosperous, you'll be set on high. But the better covenant says, and we talked about it in our previous lesson, right? About salvation. 
You get eternal life with it. You get victory over your enemies. You are, you have prosperity, just like the old one. But, and most of all, both of these require Torah. Period. You can't have it without it. That's why this covenant just is better because the promises are more. The promises are greater. They're the same promises with some more promises. <laughs> so it's a build onto the old. All right. Anybody want to add? You can just say that um, the the wheel, the original wheel, has been modified and made better. It's been amended. Mm -hmm. It's been amended, yes. That's right. It's been amended. All right. So right here, we now can say it's a better covenant, a superior covenant, same thing. Superior means better. But this didn't replace the original because if it did, we'll be calling Yah. A fibber, and we know he's not that, because it says in Genesis 17 and 7, and I will establish my covenant between me and thee, and thy seed after thee, in their generation, for an everlasting covenant to be Elohim unto thee, and to thy seed after thee. We can't call him a liar, right? So there's no way that this better covenant replaces the eternal covenant. No. Mm -hmm. Anybody want to add? No, thank you. Not on this. All right. We'll keep going there. All right. So, the better covenant was created when Yahushua came to save his people and preach the kingdom is at hand. This better covenant is linked with the old. So, let's do, let's have a reader. We're going to read now what Hebrews was talking about. So let's see who hasn't read yet. Brother, brother has. Oh, Minister Ronnie, you want to read for me, please? Yes. Hebrews chapter 8, verses 6 to 8. But now has he obtained the more excellent ministry, by how much also he is the mediator of a better covenant, mm -hmm. which was established upon better promises. For if that first covenant has been faultless, had been faultless, then should then should no place have been sought for a second. For finding fault with them, he said, Behold, the days come, says Yahweh, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Mm -hmm. I think your phone is on mute, brother. It sure was. I'm sorry. <laughs> I said, we're going to continue reading on the next slide, and I wanted Minister Ryan to finish up with this one, too. Okay. Hebrews chapter 8, verses 9 through 10. Not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, because they continued not in my covenant, and I recorded them not with Yahweh. But this is the for this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, that God will, I will put my Torah in their mind and write them in their hearts. And I will be to them a Elohim, and they shall be to me a people. There you go. This is an example right here alone of the old, the New Testament quoting the old. And what is required of this one? Just like the old one, original covenant, this covenant requires Torah. The difference is, Yah is not going to leave it up to us to do the right thing, teaching it to all of us and all that, through the priesthood and all that, no, and, mm -mm, or the prophets. No, he's going to write it on our hearts and minds himself with his spirit, mm -hmm. bypassing the, ne the necessity of all that. But it's the same thing. It still requires Torah. And we're talking about our Messiah being the mediator of this. So how does the church separate the Messiah from this, from the covenant that requires the law, Torah? I don't understand. This is right here in the New Testament. This is right here in front of us. So 
that this will have to be explained away because it's saying that the Torah will be written on your minds and hearts. Now, they might argue and say, well, this hasn't happened yet. That's, that's the only argument I can see them saying. Uh, I'll ask them, how do you expect it to happen? <laughs> Are you expecting it to happen some miraculous way? A big spiritual marker comes in your room and writes it on your head, forehead and in your chest? <laughs> That's what I'm thinking. A sharpie, a big spiritual sharpie. Mm -hmm. So we know then that this better covenant, <laughs> since it's, re it's referencing Jeremiah, we're going to talk about that. It's re re referencing the prophecy of Jeremiah. It's referencing Israel's pro a prophecy for Israel only. Mm -hmm. So we know then that salvation and this better covenant with better promises is only for Israel. Mm -hmm. All right. Any, anybody want to add anything? Nothing to add. Just I want to highlight it again. Notice it says that the covenant is for the house of Israel and not for the Christian church or for any other nation outside of Israel. And also, part of the covenant is he says, I will put my Torah. If you want to scratch that word out, let's look at the word law. I will put my law into their mind and write it in their hearts. So this tells you again how it cannot be for Christianity because they say the law is no more. So it's not being written in their minds and in their hearts. So this is for the house of Israel where the law is being placed in their mind and in their heart, and the better covenant is taking place with them, not the world, not outside of Israel, but inside Israel. And then Israel goes out to bring the stranger in to reveal to them what's written in their heart by the Most High. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank Anybody else? Yes, ma'am. Anybody else? I got a question. Um, I think it's in a previous slide, though, but it separates the house of Israel and then it separate and then you say the house of Judah. Correct. Why would that separate? That's separated because um, during the time of King of King Solomon, um, the 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 house of Israel was divided. Remember, um, the kingdom was 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 torn. But Yah says, "For my for my servant's sake, for David's sake, <laughs> I can't tear it all away." So there were ten tribes that were removed to the north, and then there were two that was left: Yahuda and uh, Levi was with Yah. No, I think it wasn't Levi. It was, I think it was Benjamin. Benjamites. Yeah, Benjamin. It was. Mm. Yeah. yeah, it was the Benjamites. So Yahudah or Judah, I'm sorry, Judah or Yahudah, and the Benjamites were together as one, and they were just called Judah. And then the other 10 were called the house of Israel. So that division took place back then. Disobedience is what brought it about. But if you um, read in other scriptures, you'll take note that it talks about how the time is going to come when he's going to bring the two sticks back together again, he's going to bring them together and they will be, um, they'll be one, one house. Um, again, it would no longer be Israel and Judah, but he, they'll come together again. But they were separated because of um, that division that took place uh, long ago, back in the Old Testament. Got you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, is that, is that clear? Yes, it is. Thank you. Oh, you're welcome. You're welcome. All right. All right, we'll move to the next slide. All right, so since we know that it is a better covenant, we should also understand then that there is really no separation between the old original scriptures and the, and the better covenant since the better covenant is quoting Jeremiah 31 and 31. 
literally quoted it. So what the gospel's about, as they say, the basola and the letters and the books that surround the purpose of the Mashiach is referencing the prophecy that's in the old. So that this reference, this relationship that we're talking about right now should make it very clear that the old and the new are absolutely connected. Mm -hmm. All right. Now, what we're going to do to help understand this next is we're going to start showing the history. And I think the history of the New Testament needs to be seen so the audience will be able to make a rational decision and think, hmm, if this history is correct, then where did Peter teach from? And Paul teach from. Mm -hmm. They had to teach from something. Okay? Mm -hmm. So let's start talking about the history of the New Testament. And it's not known by nearly any Christian. They don't know this. They're not, they just assume that the Bible was in existence during the life of Yahushua as it is. And I, I, I mean, they just never entertained the idea how the Bible was formed. So to create our understanding, we're going to review the history of the New Testament, describing how the books were chosen and its information. So we're going to have some history now. Okay? All right, so the canon history. The canon of the New Testament, as commonly received at present, what we see now, was ratified by the Third Council of Carthage, which this is Catholicism, in 39, 3, 397 A.D. Long time ago, 1600 plus years ago. And from that time was accepted throughout the Latin church. And this is the Unger's Bible Dictionary. And the Latin church is the Catholic church because, as you'll see later on in the lesson, Latin was the language that was required for all scripture to be written in, in the Catholic church. Anything other than Latin was heresy. Which is funny to me how that just how they could just choose to call something heresy. So, what is a canon? A canon is a regulation or dogma, man's commandments and stuff like that, mm -hmm. decreed by a church council. Mm -hmm. An authoritative list of books accepted as Holy Scripture, and this is the Merriam-Webster Dictionary. This is something that has been done by the Catholic Church. Mm -hmm. Okay? And we're going to examine this direction a little further. So, the Council of Carthage, Carthage was in AD 397. They met actually on the 28th of August. So that tells you the church kept great records where they can actually use the date as well. This meeting reaffirmed the canon of scriptures, all right, what they considered canon. There was 27 books in the New Testament they, that they, call, they called canon. You had the Gospels. You had the one book of Acts, even though there's more than one book. There's 13 letters of Paul. I, I wonder why they love Paul so much. Probably because mm -hmm. his letters are so complicated, they can twist the, the, you know, twist the directions of, of, the under, of the understanding of the populace. There are Hebrews. Then you have two epistles of Peter. There's a three books of John. We have James and Jude, and then we have Revelation. Mm -hmm. This the council brings to our understanding one that there are other books that must have been denied then as well, right? If mm -hmm. they approve these, there automatically was some that did not. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So the question that I'm sorry. No, I said I said I'm Anybody? confirming. I'm just saying yes, yes. <laughs> That's all. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> and then, so the, so the question should come to mind also, if this is the Roman Catholic Church, who was at this council making such big decisions? I'm curious to that. So, I decided to take a little peek into the whereabouts of where this council was at. And this map makes a good illustration of understanding why... <sighs> Of the original people were involved in this. So who was at the council? To the right is the image of the diocese of Rome during the Council of Carthage, where the Roman Catholic Church had all of its influence 
All right. Mm-hmm. Carthage is that red tip on the tip of Africa, very north tip of Africa, underneath the Italia Suburbicaria. Okay. Mm-hmm. If you notice, it's very close to Italy and all those islands. So it was very Hellenistic and very easy to catch a boat and go there. All right. So this was not a black nation. This nation was ruled by Europe. It was very blended. And if you go in that part of Africa today, you will see very, very fair, very fair Africans. Very fair Africans. Okay? Okay. So Rome controlled this region. And there was no Hebrews in this council. I didn't bother to provide the names. But I can tell you by what I saw, there was no single Hebrew. Especially when you look at this map and see that they're nowhere near Israel in the first place. Mm-hmm. Israel's all the way over there into the part, uh, I guess, what is that, a blue? Some kind of bluish color, bluish purple, mm-hmm. where it says Orion. I mean, if they really wanted to get the, the input of the original people, why not go over there and, and ask them what's canon? They're the ones, they're the ancestors, their ancestors wrote it. I guess they could no longer tell people who or what was really good in their scriptures. Somehow they, they just lost that authority and, and, a, and a group of people that would, had been historically pagan has the right to make that choice now. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That's how the church, that's how the church is, by the way. You know, that's, that's the Catholic church for you. Anybody has any questions with this? I don't. I would like to make just one brief comment. Um, the question that I was answering before we got to this point about the the two t- the two sets of houses, I want to give the reference for that the scriptural reference. Um, you can look in Ezekiel chapter thirty seven and verse nineteen. Ezekiel chapter thirty seven and verse nineteen. Um, it says, "Say to them, this is what the sovereign Yahuwah says." I will take Ephraim and the northern tribes and join them to Judah. I will make them one piece of wood in my hand. So I want you to have the scriptural reference for that, just in case you were going to share it with someone else. That's all, brother. Thank you. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you. All right. If this is clear, we'll continue with the history lesson. All right. Now, we know that the original New Testament, as it stands, had no input by Hebrews, by the way. The Hebrews had no input on forming the books, mm-hmm. the book of the New Testament. Later in the 4th century, the books that were canonized in Carthage were put into a single book and called the New Testament. To illustrate further the late arrival of the New Testament books, let's look at the approximate dates of when each book was written. You have Matthew, the Gospels, 35 AD, 42, 59, and John 42. Even though that might be questionable, they say that most likely this may be the the oldest. And then you have the Acts, and in chapter 1 through 13, 58 through 60 AD. All right, so these are decades, decades after the death of the Messiah. All right, mm-hmm. we have the remaining books: we sixty-three to fifty, sixty-seven A.D. Paul's letters. So Paul had been writing for well, seventeen years. He wrote those letters, from what the history says. And as you can see. All of these, I think, here's the oldest, Revelations was the, um, I'm sorry, the youngest out of all the group. All right, so each book, like I said, was written many years after the death of Messiah. With these dates in mind, where did they teach from? If there was no, there was no New Testament. There was no Hebrews, there was no Ephesians, there was no Romans. None of those things. So where did all these wonderful disciples, where did our Messiah teach from? So 
Oh, yeah. Yeah. I think his phone dropped. That's where they had to. Oh. Yeah, that's where they had to. You broke up, brother. Could you please um, reiterate what you were saying? Sure, no problem. I'm sorry. I was saying if these dates are so late, then where did the uh, rest of the people talk from? They had to teach from something. And it was Torah and the prophets. Because mm -hmm. that's all they had. Mm -hmm. That's all they had. And they didn't have none of the other books. Can you imagine while Paul was traveling across the known world at that time that he stopped by um, James and got his book from him so he can have it on his way, on his journeys? <laughs> I, I, I highly doubt that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I highly doubt that. That's a good point. Yeah, I highly doubt that. All right. Mm -hmm. So, anybody want to add any more to this? We got a good understanding that the current, the historical timeline of the New Testament means that Paul, Peter, James, John, Matthew, Mark, and all of them, all of them could not have taught from a New Testament. They had to teach from the old. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. So let's go to the next slide and continue with our canon history. There were many books that were rejected by the councils, like we talked about earlier, that there's probably some that were rejected that formed this New Testament. So we, we must understand that New Testament development had nothing to do with the authors at all. They had no input. It wasn't like they were saying, here, I'm going to write this letter to Rome. Make sure you put it in a book 20, 30, no, I'm sorry, 250 to 300 years later or so. They don't say that. They had no intentions of these being in the book. These letters were written, or these books were written for record or for education. All right, now it doesn't it doesn't take away their their scriptural relevance because the great thing about it is, is that they taught from the original scriptures. All right, so let's see what other books were refused by the councils. Believe it or not, Peter, there's Apocalypse of Peter, and this this is a pretty extraordinary. Can you imagine getting a description of the tortures in hell mm -hmm. and the and the benefits of heaven? Mm -hmm. The Epistle of Barnabas, quotes of Torah, and claims Torah points to the Messiah. I think that one would have been extraordinary to just to have as well. Then you have the Infancy Gospel of James. <laughs> that is a book, yes, a book about the Messiah's childhood. I don't know how true that would be, but that does exist. You have the Gospel of Thomas, which focuses on Yahushua's teachings, but doesn't mention his death. And then you have the Dida, or the Lord's teachings of the Twelve Disciples. And it teaches daily life of the believer, the daily life of the believer. All right, that's just some of what was not included. All right, anybody has any input on these? No. All right, let's 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 move to the next slide. And there's some more books. I just wanted to add a few more, too, because I thought they were very interesting. You had a third letter of the Corinthians. They, the reason that one wasn't included, because they weren't sure if Paul was actually the author. Then they have the gospel according to the Hebrews, and they considered this book actually lost and thus never canon. So it, it's important to understand the following. The authors of the scriptures that we read currently were all Hebrews. The audience of the scriptures were all Hebrews. Mm -hmm. Some of the books that were not included had questionable origins. We have that, that I can understand, especially like the infancy book, the gospel, the infancy gospel. And, and all of these decisions and this is one that's really impactful that we're just not taught to think like. 
were made by non Hebrews, people who never wrote the scriptures, who has no historical link to the scriptures. To me, just think of the audacity if I came and conquered Rome and took all their pagan history and said it's mine and I'm going to do whatever I want with it. That's what the church did. They just took something of, that, were, that was never theirs. And, and and made decisions that impacted the world. Doesn't this uh, right. doesn't this bring to life the 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 lesson? No, the scriptures from the previous lessons, where it says, "If you do not obey, it's one of the curses." I think it was De- Deuteronomy twenty eight forty three. I think it was forty three, where it says, "If you do not obey my um my laws, my statutes, my covenants, you know, my precepts." that the stranger that is within thee shall um, get up over thee and you shall be below. Isn't this what mm-hmm. happening? This is what's happening here. We have the stranger here handling scriptures that were never given to them. And they are making, they are making, um, you know, life changing decisions regarding these scriptures. And now this, this, their decisions have been um, dispersed throughout, uh, throughout the whole world. And it was never, it was never there to be able to go forward with, but they made they made these changes, and this is all because of how Israel fell back in Deuteron- um, Deuteronomy when Yah was talking about it. He says, "When you fall, this is what's going to happen to you, and not only that, but this is what happens to the scriptures that I gave you." Now they have them, and they do with them what they want, and they teach them how they want, and they adjust them how they want. That's right. Boy, have they done a good job at that. Mm-hmm. <laughs> they have done a great job at screwing things up, and they don't even realize they've done that. <sighs> Anybody else want to add anything? Does this also go with um, the scripture that says that the pain of the pride are in vain, and they'll think to change times and laws and all that stuff? Daniel chapter 7. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes, yes, indeed. Mm. In fact, I thought of that when it, when we were just talking about that. I was thinking of that. Mm-hmm. Oh, that is so true. See, now she she yeah. opened, she opened up that can of worms. I gotta I got I gotta jump in that one too. <laughs> and, <laughs> and Daniel <laughs> chapter Daniel chapter seven when it talks about changing the times and the laws. When you go when you go to dissect those two words, um, the three words, change, times, and laws. I'll summarize it. It means that they are going to continue repeatedly. It's a verb, right? They're going to continue to replace the original scriptures with something else and make it a law. Make it a king's mm-hmm. de- make it a decree. By the king of Rome, so that it cannot be undone. Because remember, whatever the king puts his seal on is supposed to be unalterable. So that's what that change times and laws means. And they have done it till today because they changed the time, they changed the calendar, they changed um, the the way the scriptures are supposed to, to be looked at. And that means that they changed the, they changed the, Holy days for holidays as well. Everything is, is flipped upside down. Mm-hmm. Hmm? Yes, and they changed the Sabbath to sunrise worship days by way of death. I think that was in 325 BE. I, I can't remember. Mm-hmm. You're That's right. around that time. And also during the Maccabean like- Revolt. Oh, I'm sorry, go ahead, Miss. No, just saying you will see the Maccabean revolt in uh in Maccabees. Like one and two Maccabees, you will see how the Maccabees fought to try to keep um to maintain and hold on to the laws, but how they just they continue to persecute it out of them. <laughs> over and over. So she's right. And and like you said, they do the opposite. Sabbath went from first I mean, from the last day to now the day that they considered worship is the first mm-hmm. day of the week. They mm-hmm. slipped it. 
So, yeah. All right, let's oh, continue to got, the next slide. I got one more. I got one more, brother. <laughs> oh, go right ahead. Go one right more. ahead. Look at what they have done. They they took the Sabbath day as the from the last day and put it on the first day. But when you consider what the Sabbath means, this when the Sabbath comes to its fruition, it will be the last thing. When you really get the rest from the Most High, it will be the last thing. So it is the last day. But they took that and flipped it and said, nope, it's going to be the first day. But the reason he put it on the last day is because of what it symbolizes also. Okay, I just wanted to add that piece. Mm -hmm. Completion. Yeah, it does. And it completes the bride, right? Mm -hmm. So how is it going to complete the bride if it comes first? Exactly. Mm -hmm. All right. I love correlation and confirmation. <laughs> All right. So we're on the next slide here. With all this history, the first widespread edition of the books that were canon were assembled by a gentleman named St. Jerome around 400 AD, known as the Latin Vulgate. St. Jerome was not involved with selecting the books we discussed earlier. All right? Mm -hmm. And he was the first to translate them all the same language for the first time and compiled them into a single volume. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, in 600 AD, the Roman Catholic Church declares Latin as the only language for scripture. This is significant. It is. Not only if, if you understand this, this, this right here is a huge sin mm -hmm. because by changing the scriptures to Latin, you, and we've demonstrated this in our previous lesson. You take away the true and more and the spiritual meaning behind the language of Hebrew. It's gone now. Because mm -hmm. you put it in a language that is not Semitic. Now, Rome also used Latin because it controlled it controls the population because only a select few spoke and read Latin. So by putting the language, putting the scriptures into Latin. You can control what's learned and who can learn it. So th it wasn't some special thing. They did this for control. This is some evil stuff. Evil stuff. Mm -hmm. All right. Anybody want to answer this? You know, when they... S <laughs> I, I know you're probably saying I'm chatty. <laughs> when they switched this from the from the Shemitic language, from the he from Hebrew to Latin, we lost the pictorial understanding of our language. Mm -hmm. We lost that. We lost the um, understanding of the alphabet of our language. Right? What we what I'm saying is we lost the multi layered understanding of our language, which Latin nor English can ever capture. Not only um, did we lose that, there is a there are um, there are numbers. There is a gematria that's assigned to the aleph bet. We lost that too. So when we we lose those layers of understanding, it's hard to see the scriptures from an from um, the Hebraic point of view because it's being it's actually presented from the Roman or Latin point of view. If you will, if you understand what I'm saying, that's true. Mm -hmm. Just like you see in your English translations, there from an English point of view. Yes, Western mindset. It, 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 mm -hmm. you, you see that in anything. Whenever an outside culture is investigating a culture that can't represent itself, cannot represent itself, they will, without conscience define what they find from their own cultural point of view. It's mm -hmm. instinctively done. It takes effort not to do that. This is why people like us are not found so often or very infrequently in churches or anything else because it takes an effort for you to realize you shouldn't be doing that and that you need to read the book from the 
author's perspective, the Hebrew perspective. Because mm-hmm. that's who wrote it. Mm-hmm. That's who wrote it. All right, anybody else? That's all. All right, let's. Oh, go ahead. It just amazes me how much thought process went into dissecting and um, doing away with so much information in books just to create this controlled system that we live in today and and have religious beliefs and all those things. It just, I don't know, I'm in shock, <laughs> but I'm not in shock. But it just amazes me. I'm like, where did they get such an evil plan? You know, where did these thoughts come from to say, let's just take all of this and just pull all these books out, keep all these business met. Like, what was the thought process? <laughs> you know, how did they know that those specific books, I mean, they had to read all of them. It's just, that's my thought. They did. And they spent lifetimes making these decisions. Because it was not vital. It wasn't a quick, deep thing. In fact, it would take them years, 10 years or so, to write a copy of the, of the scriptures now in their language. It, it was a huge effort. Huge effort. You want to know right, anybody why, else? They, why they spent, why they expended so much energy in doing this? If you if you can grab what I'm saying, this goes back to Rebecca. Two nations are in your room, Esau and Jacob. Yeah, they do. In the end, Jacob rules, and it has been a lifelong journey for them to ensure that Jacob never rules. Esau is the end of the world. Jacob is the beginning of the new one. And they're doing their best to ensure that never comes to fruition. It has been a lifelong mission for them to stay in power and to keep the others oppressed and away from what is their inheritance. That's what this is all about. Even now. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Wow. And they took the time to uh, erase his name. But every Bible, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. every Bible, they, they lied about his name. They took off a left cross, which means oath and contract. They took that out of the Bible. They really had no they had no time or reason to do it except to control it. That's true. It's a make sure that we never get back to our roots, that we never get back to who we are. And, and Eric, I got a statement. Tommy, um, just think about um, Christ's contrast to how long it took them to do this. How long do you think it took them to make up the name Jesus Christ for the Council of Nicaea? It took them years. It took them years. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, they, and they took their, I mean, they took their time being paid. So just think about it. They, they, they come up with a name of a person who never existed, never got anything, just, and, and took them years to do it. So I could spend years to change the scriptures. I just want to say that. Thank you. And you know, and there's some people that will say, well, that's conjecture. And maybe you can say that, all right? Let's say you can say that. But boy, is there some correlation that just can't be explained away when you talk about that type of history. And then you say, okay, well, maybe there, maybe there is a little difference in the name, but it's just a translation. You can't translate Jesus from Yahusha or Yahushua or Yahawashai. That's impossible. Mm-hmm. But it came from transliteration. But when you transliterate names or any word, you cause the potential of future misspellings. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And that's exactly what we can easily prove. 
Now, I can go into history that talks about um, Eastern Krishna, for example, and I can tell you about uh, the druidic belief of Jesus and the and the and the um the the goddess or the the, the fake the pagan god of um, India, Krishna, the savior god of India, Krishna. We can go on. There's there's too many coincidences, right? But one thing they can't argue: transliteration is not translation, and it's the root one of the big root causes of of a name that should never exist. Um, all right. Anybody else want to add on this slide? Well, if not, we'll keep keep it moving. It's not just a misspelling of names, you know. When they when they um, mess with the names like that, Hebrew names, you lose the meaning of the name. One and two, you lose the story that's attached to the names okay. because. Yah has names lined up in the Bible, and when you connect the names together, they tell a story. But you lose that when they begin to change the names. So they destroy you know, so much. Go ahead, please. No, and I was just saying it's true, because I recently looked at a slave, a slave ledger from the very early 1800s and late 1700s with the names of the slaves. When they removed the Most High's name from Scripture, they also removed the identity of the people. Because all you got to do is look at one group of people in the world, especially during those years. This is before the fake state that we see today. And there was only one group of people that had Yah in their names. And you found a whole bunch of them in South Africa and West Africa. And and so it also helped them hide the identity of the real people too. Yeah. All right. Let's continue to the next slide here. Now listen to this history. This history tickles me to tell you how messed up the Catholic Church is and its history. So the scriptures were controlled by Europe till this day, till the modern age, right? Mm -hmm. And Rome outlawed any commoner. This is messed up. You could not own a Bible. You couldn't own a Bible. It was illegal. This is how controlling Rome was. If you wanted to know what you're supposed to have done for your salvation, you had to go to Rome. And Rome was in power, and it controlled the world, the known world at the time. When the first English Bible was introduced by John Wycliffe in 1381 through 1382, when this man died, 31 years after his death, listen to how crazy this is. He was charged with heresy for, trans for his translation. Because remember, it had to be Latin and nothing else. That's right. Then they had enough nerves 44 years after his death. So another 13 years later, they dug up his bones and burned him because he was, her because he was considered a heretic. You can't, you can't even have your bones intact. I, I just, I, I couldn't believe the man is dead. What am I going to do? <laughs> I, I just, that, that tells you, this is an example of pagans having something they shouldn't have. Because, first of all, Hebrew ain't going to touch bones. True. Because it, it, will make them, it will make them unclean. Yes. So they wouldn't do nothing this stupid. This stupid. And these are the people that have the authority over the scriptures. Mm hmm Doing, doing weird, crazy nonsense, taking nonsense like this. Now, in, I'm sorry, I just, when I found that, I just thought that was so unbelievable. In 1560, the first printed Bible in English was produced, which was the Geneva Bible. Yeah. Now, I actually have a copy of that on my, on my computer. And in 1611, the King James Bible came out, which is the most printed book in the world, in history. It's everywhere. Okay? Mm -hmm. All right. Anybody want to add to this? I just want to say you you can see how barbaric. And, mm -hmm. and I, I don't hold my words. You can see how barbaric they are when you can go get the dead and burn the dead after they have been dead. 
for a number of years. What 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 do you think they would do to the living? Because these are the people that are in control today. What do you think they are going to do to the living when they remove the gloves, which they are about to do? If they have no mercy for the dead, what will it look like for the living? This, this would, should make people want to run from church today. If you, if you think that's old and they won't do it now, all you got to do is look at American history and see what they did some, to some of um, Judah. Oh, yeah. So when when you Americans. say strange fruit, we're not talking about vegetables and apples and pears and fruits. And, no. <laughs> Yeah, and how they they uh, have all the pictures with little, all of these little black, I'm talking about as black as they could be, little black kids sitting on top of alligators. I'm like, what? What else with that kid on top of alligators? <laughs> yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, they treated yeah. you as if you were. That gator they from. Yep. Yeah. They treated you like chum. Chum, something they'll throw in the ocean to draw something to eat. So they can catch a large fish. It's just if they can, they, they, so they know the brutality of them. And, and I don't care what they say; they're well capable of still doing. Mm -hmm. They're well capable. Nothing's changed. Well, I'll take mm -hmm. it back. Something has changed. Iniquity abounds. <laughs> so that's changed. That's true. They've gotten worse. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, lawlessness abounds, thus there's no love, because with only way love could be shown if law was abound, because with law was about obedience, and obedience proves love. That's why when lawlessness is present, there is no love, or the love of when many were wax cold. Mm -hmm. All right, we're going to move to the next slide here. And what I plan on doing is just finishing our canon history, and then we'll uh, we'll call it a, call it a day on this lesson. So the canon history of the New Testament, as you can see, is 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 quite startling. It proves that those who possess the scriptures now, even to this day, should have never had them. The New Testament came much later after Yahushua's death, so we do know then that what was being taught in his life what was read in the synagogue, what Yahushua used to go on every Sabbath to do was teach the Torah and the prophets. Mm -hmm. That's what he did. Because mm -hmm. he couldn't have read anything else when he went to the synagogue and the temple. The canon history of the New Testament does not take away the scriptural importance of the Gospels, books, letters, and so on, because they're great, great examples of what those Hebrew teachers knew. How else would I knew what Paul knew or understood or taught? And he knew some spiritual, high-level secret stuff if he did not write it down for us. Mm -hmm. So I thank the most high for that. What we should draw from this history is that the authors of the books and letters taught from something that was already available to them when they were alive. And what we see today as a new book is not a direct result of the original authors but of the Catholic Church. Mm -hmm. Because I guarantee you, Paul never intended his letters to be collected and considered a book. He just, they weren't thinking of that when they wrote it. But with the history of the New Testament detail, we're going to then move into the Old Testament books, its authors and timeline, just so we can understand how old and ancient these books are. All right? And we'll do that in our next lesson. So we're going to end part one of the old being replaced by the new. I don't think so, right? And that the new is definitely the old. So thank you all for online joining us today on this Shabbat and this lesson. We appreciate everyone involved and whoever joined us today. We thank you so much. And we also thank those who are present with us. And we say shalom to those who are going to watch this video in the very near future. Shalom.